All right. Do angels have the ability to know what you're thinking? Great question. I think so. I think they have. I think they have abilities beyond like what we have because they're beings of spirit. Right. Um, but isn't that a almost a god quality, though? Well, that, I don't think they're not all knowing, and they're not all seeing. They're not all powerful. Right. You know, but they do have abilities beyond what we have. Because I was just thinking about like Satan being the fallen angel, mm -hmm. and we had that conversation last week about right. how does the Satan and the demons know what you know you're thinking and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, I think they're very good observationists; they can hear, you know. Yeah, I mean, I was, I don't know, and maybe I'm contradicting myself. I don't know because you know, Scripture doesn't tell us. Mm -hmm. But you know, do they? Can they see hidden things? Yes. You know, because you know we were talking about exorcism mm -hmm. and talking about. Um, the marks of exorcism and what I actually told you is wrong. Uh, once an exorcism has begun, certain things will manifest. One of those things is hidden knowledge. Mm. Can, does this person have knowledge of something they have no possible way of knowing? Uh, and that's the demon giving them that information. So, uh, the, yeah, so the, the demons and angels can see, have hidden knowledge, knowledge okay. that would be hidden to us. Right. Okay. Um, what, what part was wrong? That uh, you have to have those kind of signs before they do an exorcism, just like those don't actually manifest until you're actually doing it. Oh, okay. You know, so I've been rereading one of my guys. It's like, oh yeah, I had that room. Okay. So hmm. um, yeah. So can angels see what's you know? I mean, do, can angels sense when something's about to happen? Do they are they prescient to a certain degree? Like, you know, like what made you stop stepping off the curb when that car what you didn't see was coming? You know, can your guardian angel grab you by the scruff of the neck mm -hmm. a little bit? I hope so. <laughs> Probably, which would mean they could see. They, yeah, I had that knowledge. Right? Um, but we don't know. Biblically, we don't know. Right, okay. But I would have to, if I would hazard a guess, yeah. Probably. Okay. Well, sin, since there's just to help protect us, it's almost like they would have to have some knowledge. Yeah, yeah I would yeah. think they would have to be able to perceive things we can't perceive. Okay, so we had chapter 13. We saw the vision of the dragon and the beast from the sea and the beast from the land. And we ended with the number of the beast. And now here chapter 14 starts. Then I looked and there was the lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him were 144,000. Remember we had those guys in chapter 7, I think it was. With him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. These follow the lamb wherever he goes. They have been redeemed from humankind as first fruits for God and the lamb. And in their mouth no lies was found. They are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Then another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then another angel, a third, followed them, crying with a loud voice, Those who worship the beast in its image and receive a mark on their foreheads or on their hands, they will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured unmixed into the cup of his anger, and they will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast in its image and for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Then I looked, and there was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to the one who sat on the cloud, Use your sickle and reap, for
for the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So the one who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven and he too had a sharp sickle. Then another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over fire. And he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Use your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and gathered the vintage of the earth, and he threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for the distance of about 200 miles. Wow. Cheerful. That's a lot of blood. It's a lot of blood. Mm -hmm. All right, so. And I said this was a comforting chapter, because it is. All right, so immediately following that horrific vision of the dragon and the two beasts who roar about seeking to devour God's children, St. John is given here visions that are full of comfort and strength and consolation for all believers. So we have the Lamb, we have Mount Zion, and we have the 144,000. So the Lamb is standing atop Mount Zion, and with him the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. These are they who overcome or conquered Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. So these are the believers that are faithful to the end. All believers of all time, not an actual 144,000 like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Um, again, the number 12 is the number of God's people. So it's 3, the number of the Trinity, times 4, the number of the earth gives you 12. That's the number of God's people. Uh, and then 12 squared is 144 times 10,000. Times 10,000 is 100, or times 10,000 is 144,000. Uh, so when you square a number, that just intensifies its meaning. And then when you multiply by 10,000 square or 10 cubed, whatever, when you cube a number, uh, that intensifies it even more. So you have the number of God's people, 12 squared times 10 cubed is 144,000. That just means God's people, I really mean all God's people, I truly, seriously mean every single one of God's people. That's what it means. It just emphasizes, it means all God's people. What do the Jehovah Witnesses believe will happen when that 144,000 is reached? It's like, why do they keep doing anything? The, 100, the 144,000 get heaven and everybody else gets the new earth. The other believers, but the real top-notch believers, the first-class believers, they get they get heaven, and everybody else will get the new earth. I just don't understand how they came up with that. Uh, what a defeating religion! Like seriously, yeah. You'd be like, ugh, I bother. Yeah, it's like you're never going to be good enough to right. get up there. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's depressing. Mm -hmm. No, because it depends on you. Right. It depends on you. Your salvation is never sure. We just talked about that. Yep. So, um, so Mount Zion, Zion, Jerusalem. So when we talk about Z Mount Zion, we talk about Jerusalem in a New Testament context. We are talking about you know the wherever all the believers are, right? That's the church. Mm -hmm. So Zion, Jer the New Jerusalem, what have you? When you hear those terms, we're talking about the church. That's the church invisible. That's the true believers. We don't know that. I mean, we think all three of us sitting here at this table are believers, but we don't know. Only God knows that. I mean, we have a pretty good idea, but the church invisible, we are the visible church. We're looking at each other. The invisible church is the actual believers, uh, which only God can see. So that, when you, hear, when you refer to Zion, that's who you're talking about. All right, so the believers are standing with the Lamb, Jesus, upon Mount Zion, the Holy Christian Church, where Satan cannot touch them. So while on earth they belonged to the church militant. So if you look in your hymnals, there's a whole section called the church militant. That's where you've got like uh, um, honorable Christian soldiers, uh, a mighty fortress is our God. Those are all church militant hymns. So the church militant is us. We're the church militant. We're the church here on earth. Uh, then you have the church triumphant. That's where a lot of your funeral hymns come from because that's heaven. The church triumphant 
is what we are looking forward to, but not yet. Right? That's our our eternal reward. That's the church triumphant. So what we're seeing here uh, are these saints who have always believed, never gave up, never gave up the faith, uh, remained faithful to Christ, suffered all, even death, rather than deny their Savior. So now St. John is seeing this vision of the believers in the church triumphant. That's what he's starting to see. So that's when you start seeing the throne room. Like we saw back at the beginning, we see that same thing. You saw the lamb, you see the four living creatures, you see the elders with their crowns. So we're seeing the throne room of God. That's the church triumphant. So the message we get here is very clear, even though, like in the previous chapter, Satan manifests himself in many various ways in the world for the purpose of deceiving God's children so that they forsake the faith. Those who remain faithful, in other words, those who live lives of daily repentance, trusting in Christ as their Savior, doesn't mean leading a perfect life, you can't. It just means, okay, yeah, when you realize, yes, I'm a sinner, I need to repent, and you repent, you turn toward God, you repent, and you believe Christ died for you. Those who remain faithful are assured of victory and life uh, to the full in Christ's eternal kingdom. And that's who this 144,000 are. And then we see that phrase again, a new song. They sing a new song before the throne. So you're seeing a continuation of the great Te Deum Laudamus that we saw at the beginning of the book. Uh, you know, to the O God we praise. Uh, we, uh, this song that has no end that's going on in the throne room. Uh, so it's the divine liturgy the hymnody which belongs to heaven uh, that we can't even imagine the beauty of. You know, we have these visions, we see these things, we hear these, read these words. We have no idea what that's like. What's hymnody? Hymnody. 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 It's, it's your hymns. Just like psalmody is your psalms. Hymnody. hymnody. Yep. Uh, okay, so we can't even imagine this beauty, but guess what? We catch a glimpse of it. You know, we now see through a glass dim, dimly, so we see it in our divine service, because the point of our divine service is to mirror what's happening up there. So our worship service is mirrored on what we know of the worship in heaven, and what we know of that is because it's modeled after Jewish worship, which was modeled after what's happening in heaven. You know, the sanctuary, the tabernacle was designed based on what's in heaven, mm -hmm. and likewise our sanctuary is based on that Jewish tradition. So that's why we have things like candle stands with seven candles on them. Most, most of the churches have seven. Ours have five for some reason. Uh, yeah, so we're, we catch a glimpse of that in our divine service, and then you catch an even greater glimpse in the Lord's <laughs> Supper because at that moment, heaven comes to earth. You know, which is why we can say, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, right? it's like, why can we say that? Because heaven came to earth in the communion liturgy. You are communing outside of time and space. We don't think about that, but it is true. So you are communing with the saints in heaven. You are communing with everybody who has ever communed before. You're communing with every table at every church on Sunday morning on earth. Even though we all have church at different times and in different places, we're all at that table together. It's actually out of time and space. It's kind of neat Probably when you like, think oh about goodness, it. We have to drink more wine? Yeah. <laughs> Up in heaven. Yeah. Time again. But I think they know a guy that can make it, so it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the, here, that's when you see that glimpse when heaven comes to earth and you actually step outside of time and space for a moment. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. Okay, so liturgy and the divine service are for believers. The divine service is not a time for evangelism which is one of my arguments against some of the reasons people use for contemporary worship. Well, because they say, well, this is how you reach people that don't, you know, that are outside the church. Well, the church isn't for people outside the church. The church is for people who believe. That's what the liturgy is for. Let me, let me continue with that a minute. So that's not the time for evangelism. There's a time and place for evangelism in the divine service is not it. Um, divine service is a time when believers gather in the Holy of Holies, where God's presence dwells to confess our sins, receive forgiveness, life, and salvation through the means of grace. 
through his holy word and through his sacraments. That's only for believers. Uh, and then only believers who have been catechized in the faith can know and understand what is going on in the divine service. You tell a visitor, hey, right here at this moment, this is where time is, we're going to be outside time and space, and we're going to commune with all the people in the world. They're just going to go, what? <laughs> okay. Right. right. It's not for them. Not yet. Uh, and we don't apologize for that. Okay. And we don't ever dare design our worship services around the wants and the desires of the unchurched, which is going to sound exclusionary, but it's not, because again, the divine service itself is not for evangelism. It's not for unbelievers. Um, if they're to become churched, then they have to get catechized in the faith. They have to learn uh, so they can know and understand what's happening in church. That doesn't mean you can't come to church until you know what you're doing. It just means you come to church and you learn what's going on, right? But uh, So that's my little aside. Um, but the book of Revelation is wonderful for defeating some of the proof texts people read for why you have to do it this way now, this contemporary way now, because you have to reach these people. It's like, no, you don't have to do anything. This is the worship modeled on what's happening in heaven. Heaven is for believers. Heaven, right? And so when heaven comes to earth, well, it's still for believers. That makes total sense. Okay, so now those who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. Um, is this about sexual immorality or not? I waffle on this. Uh, many commentators say it does have to do with uh, just, it doesn't mean they're literally virgins. Okay. Uh, it refers to the sexual purity to uh, purity in general that exists in all believers. The references to sexual, sexual immorality. Um, and believers are clothed in the robe of Christ's holiness and righteousness. They are pure, seen by God as, quote, scare quotes, virgins. Um, many commenters say that. Most of the time, when you are talking about sexual immorality in the book of Revelation, you are not actually talking about sexual immorality. You are using that as, a, as an aphorism for uh, false teaching and false gods. All right, so it's because, you know, you think of it, Christ is the bridegroom, the church is the bride, and that is a holy union between Christ and the church. So if you cheat on Christ, you're worshiping a false god even if that false god is you so when you cheat on the relationship between christ and his bride the church when you are sexually immoral in that method of thinking then you are you're listening to false teachers you're following false gods so most of the time in revelation when you're talking about fornication you are talking about false teachers so like when the whore of babylon is on the back of the beast um, she's not a prostitute. She's a false teacher. Okay, and she's like drinking. She's drunk, right? Woo! She's riding. It's like girls gone wild with the wine glass. Okay, so th that's not actually a prostitute. That's a false teacher. That's the yahoos on TV that are telling you if you like put your hands on the TV and send me money, I'll fix everything that's wrong in your life. Okay, that's the horror of Babylon. These false teachers. So the ones who keep themselves pure are the ones who believe the gospel. Um, is it wrong to think of it as, as actual literal sexual immorality? No. It, but it does, I think you get a richer understanding of this book when you consider that even in the epistles sometimes when they're talking about fornication and, and that kind of thing, uh, they're not talking about sex, they're talking about false gods, false, te false beliefs. But either way, don't do it. Yeah, either way, don't do it. <laughs> okay, so they're clothed in the robe of Christ's holiness and righteousness. Um, again, you think of that. What is that What is that robe of Christ's righteousness? Does that mean that you are a vestal virgin? No, it means you're a baptized and forgiven child of God. That's what that robe of righteousness is. So it's all about uh, possessiveness, the possessiveness of the bridegroom to the bride, the church that you can't take away what belongs to Christ, and Christ, you know, you, Christ declares you spotless and holy. You know, like the, like the sacrifices in the Old Testament. You know, you had to be a spotless, 
a blemishless animal to be considered for a sacrifice. And like we're spotted and blemished, Jesus says, no, I, I've covered you with my robe of righteousness in your baptism. And all that stuff is hidden, even though it's still there while we're here. It's still there. But God doesn't see it. The Father doesn't see it. He sees his son when he looks at you. Uh, that's what that robe of righteousness does. So sexual immorality, no. Being true to the gospel, believing the gospel and repenting, yes. Um, those that follow the lamb, uh, first fruits, no lie was found for they are blameless. Uh, more language describing the purity of all believers, which is there through faith in Christ. Uh, the point being made here is that these 144,000, which is all believers of all time, including you and me, are perfectly holy and righteous through faith in Christ for his perfect holiness and righteousness covers our imperfections and sinlessness. And then on the last day, believers will be seen who they truly are because we actually will be spotless and blameless and blemishless, blemish, blemishless. Uh, and we'll dwell in perfect you know, harmony with one another and with God forever. Made it to verse 6. <laughs> So verse 6, and then I saw another angel, there's a lot of angels flying around. So verses 6 to 13, after seeing the blessed reality of the saints on the last day, which is just seeing this multitude on the mountaintop, St. John is given a vision of three angels and the harvest of the earth. And the focus here is on God's judgment. So this is the end of the world, you're seeing. The 144,000 are on the mountaintop, and now everybody else is getting judged. All right, so... Uh, except for verses 12 and 13, which deal with how the saints became become numbered with 104,000 by enduring to the end. Okay, so this area, if you read, if you, you read enough about Revelation in different commentaries and even online, um, then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to pro proclaim. Many Lutheran commentators throughout history have interpreted that as referring to Dr. Luther that he was the other angel with an eternal gospel to proclaim because he refound the gospel during the Reformation uh, because he brought back and preached the eternal gospel of the justification of a poor sinner through the merits of Christ alone by faith in the very midst of the kingdom of the Antichrist, right, the Pope. He preached that gospel and with such divine zeal and power that many thousands of captives were filled with joy over the deliverance here proclaimed. That was uh, Dr. Paul Kretzmann who wrote the popular commentary of the Bible. Um, and as romantic and appealing as that notion might be for us Lutherans, right, uh, it's a little bit of a stretch to interpret this as being, yeah, that's, well, that's, that's Martin Luther. No, it's not. There were many before him, and there have been reformers after him that try to keep to, it's like every, every pastor, every bishop, every whatever, <coughs> that has tried to maintain and faithfully preach the gospel to his people is, is that angel, is the one they're preserving that gospel. Um, Bless you. Thank you. Yep, so the context suggests that this angel brings forth the eternal gospel throughout history to every nation and tribe and language and people. So the point is that the gospel is proclaimed to every generation and that those of every generation who do not heed it will be judged. Okay, and then we have verse 8. Then another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And ooh, that's the first time Babylon gets used in Revelation. Um, we'll see Babylon again in 1619, 175, 182, 1810, and 1821. Babylon is the symbolic name for all the evil enemies of the Christian church. Why? Because the Babylonians took the Jews, took the kingdom of Israel captive. You know, right, there were one of those four kingdoms in the Old Testament that captured them. So you had the Babylonians, you had the Assyrians, you had the uh, Persians, and you had the other guys to whatever. Babylon, Assyria, Persia. Greece. So it's the fallen is Babylon the Great. So that's talking about a person, not the city. No, it's talking about the city. Oh. Right. So every time, um, yeah, every time you see Babylon in 
for Revelation. It's the symbolic name for all the enemies of the church. Uh, those who are influenced, anybody who is influenced by the dragon, anybody who's influenced by those two beasts, which are corrupt human government and false teachers, remember? So Satan and the Antichrist, whoever is persecuting Christ's bride, they are Babylon. Okay, so first century Christians would have applied that to the Roman Empire. So who's Babylon? Rome. Okay. Uh, some of its emperor, emperors like Nero, like we talked about at the end of chapter 13, uh, who was you know, more than a little nuts. Right? He's directly identified as Antichrist in Revelation by the numerology. Right? So he brought a lot of persecution upon the church. And even today, there are Babylons among us. Okay, like, okay, mid 20th century, where was Babylon? What happened mid 20th century? Germany. Right, mm -hmm. so you have Germany. Where's Babylon today? Some might say. Washington, D.C. You know, some, right. right. some might say the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Some may say wherever communism still has a hold. Isn't it all of it? Yeah. It's not like. Every, anything that's against Christ is right. Antichrist and is right. therefore Babylon. Right now is most of the world. Which is, yeah, which, yeah. You know, which is why we can ask the question is the end getting closer? Because the Bible says it's going to get really bad before. No, it's when it seems like everything's Babylon, come Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but the point here is Babylon has fallen, okay, because this is the end. This is one of the many times in Revelation the world ends, because it ends more than once. That's the cycle. So we see here the world ends, the 144,000 are on the mountaintop with the Lamb, Babylon has fallen. So whoever these opposers of the Holy Christian Church on earth are, they are defeated. All right, they're fallen. The Lamb has won the victory. Babylon may seem to be winning the day throughout history because the devil's influence is tremendous in the world. And the majority of people in the world fall prey to his temptations and deceptions, the greatest of which do involve literal sexual immorality. Uh, but Babylon is fallen nonetheless. Yeah. Porn is huge. <laughs> oh, it's on just basic TV anymore. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's like... Compelled to little kids. You know, and, oh, and honestly, we, you know, you watch a t you watch a TV show now, and I'm not sitting there thinking, "Wow, since when is this okay to show on TV?" I just watch it like it's nothing, and then realize, right? This wouldn't have allowed to have been shown on oh. TV. But even look at kids' video games, and I mean, that's what it's getting on. Well, and their animation. Oh, right, and it's become more and more it's socially acceptable. Well, well here's a story right, from my daughter's high school, and I don't know if you guys know what hentai is. It's anime porn. Oh, oh. And so one of the boys is sitting in class watching hentai during class. Oh, so he's watching cartoon porn during yeah. class. And everybody's just like, oh, yeah, that's he does that. <laughs> like, My question would be, why is he watching anything in class? Yeah. Where's that teacher? You can ask that question, too. Though, like, coming from that side of it as well, <clears throat> teachers have no control anymore. Like, it's not even like it's them. It's, it's their hands are tied always, mm -hmm. you know? Why, why are they allowed to watch gadgets? Cause well, because they, they all have laptops. Because they're probably not allowed they to have get They Chromebooks. They're supposed to be probably doing something else yep. on their Chromebook, and that's what he's doing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Kids are... Yeah. Yeah. They don't, they don't see anything wrong with it at all. Well, because the parents don't see anything wrong with it either. Right. So. But the point is, Babylon has fallen. So Babylon is done. Uh, Good. Christ is won. Good. That's what we're seeing in this chapter. So Amen. the battle is over. Christ is already won, which is comforting to know that for Christians of all time, whoever who they are, wherever they are, that undergo persecution, that undergo a lapse of hope and just think, okay, the devil's winning. We talked about the sermon today. Right? It seems sometimes like he's got the upper hand. Maybe it looks like that, but he doesn't. He's going to lose. He's already lost. You know, it's already, it's decided he's, gonna, he's lost. He lost on the day Christ was crucified and rose from the grave, so. It doesn't stop him from trying all these centuries. No, no, it's just like, just like a snake. When you cut its head off, body keeps moving for a long time. So basically what he's saying, at this point in Revelation, 
we're getting closer and closer to going heaven and drinking wine, right? Yes. All right, so this is one of those this is one of those visions in Revelation, the world is over, judgment days happen. Okay, so then you have um, bu, 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 number chapter verse nine. Uh, another angel, a second uh, another angel, verse nine, a third followed, crying with a loud voice, those who worship the beast and its image and receive a mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They will also drink the wine of God's wrath poured unmixed into the cup of his anger and be tormented with fire and sulfur in the place of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. That's terrifying. Uh, this is when all the unbelievers are going, oh crap, this is real. Yeah, this is when everybody's going to go, oh, holy crap, God's real, and oh, I can't do much now about it. Now it's too late. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, so it's a repeat for, ev- uh, uh, for emphasis of what we saw in chapter 13. There's two kinds of people in this world. There are unbelievers and there are believers. So there are those who have the mark of the beast on their forehead and believers who have the divine name upon their forehead. Now, does that mean we have some secret QR code in UV that you need a UV lamp to see? No. Does that mean the government's going to chip us and that's the mark of the beast? No. It's not that literal. It's when you were baptized, you received the mark of Christ on your forehead and on your heart. It's the cross, Mm -hmm. right? Um, and even then, it's not the literal because the pastor made the sign of the cross over you. It's the point you were, had the name of Christ put on you. And if you don't have the name of Christ put on you, then you belong to Satan. You belong to the devil. It's, that's it. That's all that means. Oh, wait, wait, wait. What? But I thought you could still be a believer. Like, if you weren't baptized, doesn't mean it's keeping you out of heaven. Right. Anybody who believes in Jesus okay. has the name of Jesus. Okay. Right. Never mind. Yeah. Do, do, does baptism mean you're going to heaven? Yes. Do you have to be baptized to go to heaven? No. You do not. Um, and can you be baptized? And you know, that's why we, that's why we're hesitant to just oh hey you know my second cousin's aunt's brother's son wants to get baptized in the church. Will you do it? Is he going to go to church? Otherwise, it's not going to do you any good. It's like, yeah, you're baptized. You're a child of God. But if you don't learn what that means, you're going to fall away. You're going to fall away from faith. Yeah, baptism creates faith, but it has to be nurtured. You know, that's, why out, that's why they say outside the church there is no salvation and no forgiveness of sins. Does that mean I can go home and pray for my sins to be forgiven? Yes, because I understand what it means to pray because I learned it in church. I mean, can we do that on our own? Maybe, but it's a lot safer to do what we're told to do and come to church and partake of the means of grace because that's what they're for. Mm-hmm. Um, so you could be baptized and never go to church, and is that person going to heaven? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what kind of life they live, but to be able to, I can't make that judgment anyway. Only God can see it, but so you got a pretty good idea. If a person's baptized because their aunt and uncle wanted them baptized and they never set foot in church their whole life, do they have any idea who Jesus is? Probably not. Are they going to go to heaven? Probably not. Does that mean baptism didn't save them? Well, you're supposed to teach the kids. I mean, we do baptize babies, but if you just like baptize a baby and mm-hmm. throw them to the wolves, I mean, in that instance. Yes, I'll probably have a bad example, but uh, <laughs> if you just baptize a baby and never take the baby to church, Come to Babylon. They, then they then he no belongs he be belongs to Babylon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he belongs. He's going to wind up belonging to Satan because he doesn't know he doesn't know what that baptism means. He didn't grow up in the faith. He didn't grow up in the faith. Now, does that mean he's absolutely not going to heaven? That's not for me to say. But if you grow up outside the church, if you grow outside out of the instruction of the faith, so he has no idea who his Savior is, well, then how can he believe in him? Right. Now, can God, make him, can God, because he baptized him and baptism now saves you, you and your family, this is written in Mark, does that mean he's not going to heaven? I can't say that. But it's a heck of a lot more likely if I know that kid's going to church. So... And on the other hand, it's so hard. I mean, I don't know too many people that say no to baptizing a kid. Right. But it's like, it, there's an argument to be made. Hey, are you going to take a kid to church? Because if you're not, it's not going to do them any good. Yeah. 
uh, he could fall away. What about those that are like profoundly handicapped? So I'm thinking like those that like autism, mm -hmm. you know, severely autistic, where they've been baptized, maybe the parent can't go to church because of this child's needs. The Holy Spirit works when and where he wills. Right. And that's not for me to say. Uh, that's where you just have faith, that yeah. where you trust that in this case, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's just like, okay, so we baptize a retarded child who's never going to be able to go to school, like severely retarded. Right. Um, is the Holy Spirit creating faith in that child? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what he does. Right. And in that case, it's not for me to say. Yeah. But who would I be to say, well, you know, a kid's retarded, so he's probably not going to heaven. I mean, who right. would well, say that? Absolutely. Who would say yeah. that? Right. So, yeah, it's not for us to say. But when you, if you have you know, normal cognition and you have all your senses and somebody baptized you and you never set foot in a church or hear right. who Jesus is, do they have saving faith? I don't know. That's all I can say is I don't know. I mean, it's the same thing we say when you do a funeral for somebody. You know they were baptized, but you never they've never set foot in a church. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's the uncle. Of, so will you do my uncle's funeral? Okay, well, you was baptized. Okay. Right. It's like, do you go to church? No. Okay, so you got to do a funeral for this sermon, and you don't come right out and say, well, we know he's sitting in heaven right now. You, you will not hear me say that. You know, we will just say, you know, he was a baptized child of God, and we trust, you know, all we can do is trust and have faith that that's what God chose to do. But we don't know. That's the difference between this church invisible and the church visible. The church invisible, I don't know who's in it. You can baptize somebody. They can be the star of Bible study. They can be the star of confirmation class and go to every meeting, prayer circle, meal, volunteer, church service, blah, 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 blah. And they might go to hell because they don't believe. Okay. But I would never know that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the church invisible. You just don't know. But at least, I mean, like, it's totally okay to say you don't know. At least you're not lying. Right. Right. Yes, yeah, so you don't offer false hope. Because some churches do. Right. right. That you're tickling. Oh, yes, your loved one is. Yeah, no. If you don't know, say you don't know. It's okay for a preacher to say they don't know. Right. Yeah. Now, can that person who's never set foot in church all of a sudden one day go, well, <clears throat> do you know if you were baptized? Yeah, yeah, you know, I think my uncle had that done to me. He goes, well, do you know what that means? And somebody somewhere down the road tells me, he's like, oh, I want to know more. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit's working. Right, right. Okay. But it's, yeah, leave it up to God is the bottom line. Okay, so two kinds of people in the world. We went far afield <laughs> talking about it. Okay, so now we have this super graphic image, right? Um, urging those who belong to Satan to repent, because if they don't, they will drink the wine of God's wrath and suffer eternal torment in hell. The Lamb and his holy angels will oversee the judgment, ushering in its fullness on the last day. So the spirits of those who die without faith in Christ now go to hell. And their suffering will be even more severe when they are reunited with their bodies on the last day. So think about it. So it's like, okay, you die, you go to hell. But don't forget the resurrection of the dead is for all the dead. All of us, believers and unbelievers. Unbelievers will be reunited with their body too. We feel worms. No, yeah. Yeah, but we our body too. Dead. I mean, we'll be reunited with our body. And we'll be perfect and whole. I just don't want this body. So. So I always said, like, well, well, how old will we be? I mean, we're going to be like, I want to be 19. I was in, like, my best peak physical shape when I was, like, 19, 20. Mm -hmm. It's like, that was a pretty good age. I don't think you get to pick. Yeah, I don't know. And you won't care. Yeah, we won't care. Mm -hmm. But just think about that. So it's like, okay, yeah, you no, know, even the you know, unbelievers have the resurrection of the dead. So physical torment. So they're thrown into lake of, the lake of fire to suffer eternity in body and spirit. So the point is, judgment is coming. Repent. Right? 
Here's a call for the endurance of the saints. Believers are exhorted to keep the faith so they will escape the judgment awaiting unbelievers. And they must be constantly exhorted to repent and trust in Christ alone because through him they can keep the commandments of God and remain perfect in God's sight. What does that mean? It means when you are sin, you repent. And you sin in thought, word, and deed by what you've done, by what you've left undone, and things you can't even remember that you didn't know you did. Right? Because who can... If you could enumerate all your sins, you'd be here till Judgment Day, listing them all, right? So the point is, keep the faith. You know, it's not what you do that merits your salvation. It's your belief that Christ did it for you that merits your salvation. So what's also in view is the consolation for believers. The day is coming when their persecutors and enemies will be judged. Justice. Right? Eternal justice. That's when you'll see people get what's coming to them. Not according to your judgment, not according to what you desire or you think they deserve, but according to God's perfect judgment and God's perfect righteousness. So it's like, yeah, you know what? How can they get away with it their whole life? Look at that guy. I mean, he's a crook, he's a thief, you know, he beats women. <coughs> He's a scumbag. We can't catch him. You know, it gets away with it scot-free, and here you are working for a living, and your life sucks, and you have to struggle for everything. Mm -hmm. It's not fair. It will be fair. It's going to be fair. And believe me, that eternity is a hell of a lot longer, literally, than our brief time here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the comfort we see in this horrible vision. It's like, yeah, the unbeliever will get what's coming. All right? God will repay them for what they have done to his children. Justice will be served. It's a guarantee. So keep the faith. Victory is yours through the blood of Christ, and your enemies will be judged. And to further illustrate to believers that they can be certain that their vic the victory is yours if they endured to the end, you hear this loud voice from heaven in this vision, right? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Okay, Ble Believers who die are blessed because their spirits are brought to the paradise of heaven to join in that heavenly choir around the throne that we can't even comprehend what that must be like, where the Lamb is sitting. And they're released from all the troubles of this earthly life, and they may rest from their labors. Their deeds follow them. All the good works done by them are rewarded in heaven. Right? Good works don't get you to heaven, but they are rewarded there. And the greatest good work is to live a life of daily repentance and trust in Christ. The greatest deed is to believe in Christ. Good works naturally and spontaneously flow from that faith, and they'll be put on display on the last day. Uh, we see that in the Athanasian Creed. You will be judged according to the good and the bad that we have done. Not that the good and the bad we've done determines whether or not you get into heaven, but you will be rewarded for the good you do. What those rewards are, we don't know. We're not told that. Let's see, Matthew 25 had a note. The Son of Man comes in his glory, this is Matthew 25, 31. When this, this, this is right after the, the parable of the <coughs> ten foolish and ten wise virgins mm -hmm. and the parables of the talents. Like, mm -hmm. these, this guy made twice as much money as what he gave him. This guy makes twice as much money. This guy buried his because he was scared. Mm -hmm. right? So when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. And the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick, you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we do any of that? And say, Truly I said to you, just as you did the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And 
Jesus then does the opposite part, talking about the people who didn't do those things, and it says, "Truly, uh, and these th- these will go away into eternal punishment; the righteous into eternal life." You know, so you will be judged according to both the good and the evil that you have done. What the re- those rewards are, we don't know. Okay, and then in verses fourteen and through twenty, we see another vision of the last day. Uh, you know, there I looked, and there was a white cloud. Seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head. And notice, he's an angel. That's not that's not Christ, which is interesting because it says, "Tell the angel, take your sickle." Right. Uh, this chapter began with a vision of the hundred and forty-four thousand, which is all believers of all time standing with Christ on the last day. Now the chapter ends with a vision showing the judgment of the unbelievers on the last day. So a white cloud, one like a son of man, Christ will come on the clouds on the last day and his holy angels with him. That's harvest language, right? Symbolically indicating that they will be gathering all the unbelievers together and throw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God, the place of eternal torment. So extensive and terrifying is the judgment of God upon unbelievers on the last day that blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Um, what did it say in here? 200 miles. All right. So horses, as high as a horse's bridle, it's about six feet. That's six feet deep blood for 200 miles. That's a lot. Uh, the number 1,600, which is why, you know, that 200 miles, it's not always best to translate this stuff into our units because the number 1,600 stadia, which is what it says in the Greek, I believe. 20, verse 20. Uh, A multiple of four, which typically represents the earth. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so 1,600 uh, stadion. Um, So the number 1,600 is symbolic for the ultimate completeness of God's judgment. All right, so you have 4 times 4, the number of the earth, right, times 100, 100 being the square of 10, which is God's number of completeness. So you have the final, the, the thoroughness and finalness and completeness of God's judgment is what that number means. So the point, judgment upon unbelievers on the last day will be eternally severe, even as the reward upon believers will be eternally great. It will be complete. That's it. That was a good chapter. Yep. Good stuff. I'm trying to remember. There was an artist that actually drew that. They painted that, and you just see you just see like arms and legs sticking up out of the thing, and there's a it looks like a book print, like a oh, big print, and, there, and there's just blood pouring out. It's like really gross. Ooh. I don't remember. It was some it was some medieval artist did it. You have to find that. Or it's in a painting. It's like in a corner of a painting. I want to say it's maybe like a Hieronymus Bosch hmm. or one of those because he did like that Garden of Earthly Delights. That's a weird painting. And you, you notice like little weird details. Mm-hmm. It could have been Blake too. I think Blake might have illustrated this in Revelation. That's a lot of blood. Yeah. That's so. a lot of evil people. I like using those graphic Bibles to to look up things like this to see mm-hmm. how they have done it as well. Yeah, they did a pretty good job mm-hmm. with Revelation. Yeah. And I, I, I just did you think buy those two? I did. Yeah. Nice. Like Job is fantastic. Oh really? It's so good. I'll have to look that one. Yeah, that it's one. really good. But yeah, Job will be in the middle of Genesis because the book's in order. So the graphic gotcha. novel's in chronological order. So, yeah. Okay. So it's like right there in like Gen- around Genesis 20, all of a sudden it's like, this is Job. Like, okay, huh. that's about right. All right, I'll have to look. Okay, so that's it. Next week, short, probably do two chapters. Next week is 15 is really short. Because 15, 15 to 16 kind of goes a unit. You don't use this Bible.
But it will probably take us two weeks to do 15 and 16. Yeah, you know, we'll finish 15, but we'll start 16. But the two of them together, it's a good two week thing. Okay. Uh, because 16, then we're going to start the third sevenfold vision, which is the incense angels. Or the bowl angels. The bowl of God's wrath. Yeah, I like that. I saw another great, another great portent in heaven, great and amazing. Since Kai, Idon, Elo, Simeon, Eton, Uranos, Arano, Megakai, Thamiston, Thamiston. Yeah, another portent, another, another great and amazing sign. A mega sign. That's good. Use the word mega. Mega. Yep. So that's where we'll leave it for this week. We'll pick up with chapters 15 and 16, which we'll read as a unit together next time.